This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic six, strategic planning. Well, good place to start with this, I guess, is to say exactly what is it we mean in our definition of strategic planning, and that is it's a managerial process of creating and maintaining a fit between the organization's objectives and resources and evolving marketing opportunities. And so to quantify this, uh, we come to the marketing plan because this is step by step with all the attendant details. We start off with a mission statement. We'll go through a situation or a SWOT analysis. We'll come down to our objectives, then a marketing strategy, and then we'll address the issue of implementation, evaluation, and control. But let's start off, first of all, with a point on the mission statement and what we're dealing with there. That's a step number one, is to say, what business am I in? Uh, where are we going? And let's kind of think about this one a little bit, because this seems to be so simple, but maybe it's not. Like, for instance, what would you say is the mission statement of the Weather Channel? Um, most people would say, well, it's providing information and uh, data about the weather. Mm, I know. I would, I would say the mission statement of the Weather Channel is entertainment for housewives. Think about that. Think of their programming. They're not interested, basically, in nerds like me who watch it for two minutes twice a day to get the forecast. They're looking at a bigger audience. They're doing all their videos, their entertainment, their little sub-segments. Nothing wrong with that. They've identified the segment of the market most receptive to their programming, and probably by going and taking their programming and aiming it at housewives, they have a higher Nielsen share and are getting higher money for their spots. But that's their strategy in, in looking at it. It's a much broader strategy than you would think of just providing the weather. <clears throat> a narrow statement like this Defining yourself only in terms of your present products, not, not the benefits customers seek, is something that Ted Levitt of Harvard University called marketing myopia. And so again, the Weather Channel, if they say we're in the business of providing weather, no, it's too narrow, marketing myopia. Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica, define themselves in the book publishing business. Oops. Smith Corona, we're in the typewriter business. Mm, no, you're not. Kodak, we're in the film business. Ooh. General Motors, General Motors until really into the early 90s defined themselves as being in the new car business. Mm, little problem with that. They're selling new cars, but Toyota comes along and says, we're in the personal transportation business and basically saying satisfaction begins after the purchase. My own experience on this. Uh, I came down to Pensacola in uh, 1987. Still, my 1979 Cutlass was almost new at the time. But I'd been having a recurring problem with it. The tripodometer. It just kept rolling numbers over and over and over. I could take a trip down from Athens to Pensacola, and it would log out 4,000 miles in the tripodometer. I had it replaced in Shambly, Georgia, where I bought the car. <clears throat> I'd had it replaced again in Athens. <clears throat> Still doesn't. So I came down here and I talked to Mike Mitchell at the, at the late Mitchell Motors and said, Mike, I've replaced this thing twice. It's defective again. And he says, Bob, I'll tell you what, um, what we got to do with this, we got to replace it here again. But I promise you, I will follow up on this and, and see what we can do. So I replace it again. And yeah, it goes defective again. No problem. Mike Mitchell calls up Atlanta's zone office, the General Motors, and says, I got this guy here with his 1979 Cutlass. He's replaced three tripodometers. They're all defective. The response of General Motors' zone office was, that car is over five years old. We're not going to do anything about it, even if the parts are defective. Wow. That was the attitude at the time. New car business. After five years, we're done with you. Not the attitude of the Japanese cars that came in that said, we're taking care of you for the life of your car, the service, the whole time. It was very interesting. Back in, um, in the early 60s, I had an opportunity to purchase a gullwing Mercedes. You got any idea what a gullwing Mercedes would go for today? <clears throat> I'm willing to bet this, that you could take that gullwing Mercedes and drive it into any Mercedes-Benz dealer needing service for it, you'd get service. Now, they might have to fly somebody in from Atlanta to do the service, but you'll get the service. General Motors has figured this out now. General Motors now absolutely not only good products, but they have the service <clears throat> because they recognize marketing myopia. 
We're not in new car business, we're in the personal transportation business. So instead of this, Encyclopedia Britannica should have been saying, we're in the business of, of empowering imagination. Um, <clears throat> Smith Corona, we're in the business of information and data processing. Kodak, visual expression and communication. Uh, here's an interesting one to think about this year. Um, baseball season is always on the horizon, sort of like a political campaign. Who do you figure are going to be the biggest competitors this year for the Atlanta Braves? Cardinals? Yankees? No, I would suggest the biggest competition for the Atlanta Braves this year is Six Flags over Georgia or Pensacola Beach. The Atlanta Braves are not in the baseball business. They're in the family entertainment business. So this is how we have to broadly think in, uh, in, in terms of customer benefits. On this, as we organize our thinking, we come to the concept of an SBU, a strategic business unit. Basically, it's a company within a company that manages its business independently of other SBUs in the organization. Ford Aerospace. I get the Ford Aerospace division. That should be run as a totally separate company from the automotive division, sure. Completely run it as a totally separate business. Um, the Comcast Broadcast Division. You know, Comcast that now owns the old NBC properties. They own the Weather Channel, NBC, MSNBC. That's a whole different business than their cable subscription business. Run it as a separate business. Uh, let's go and just think of some of the implications of this for how you might be managing an organization and how you might think about it differently and how you might make a contribution to your company by thinking about traditional staff support as being SBUs. Uh, going back to my uh, second year at Coke, I'm working in marketing research, and the company then all of a sudden decides we're not going to run marketing research as a staff support, we're going to run it as an SBU, a strategic business unit. We're going to run it as a profit center. And I was really irritated because I got to keep track of all my time now and bill Coke brand group for this, Southeast area field office for this, stuff like this. Okay, but here's what happened with this, and, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, in the old days, you used to have all these market research services available to you, didn't, didn't show up on your, on your budget. You never thought about the kind of money you were spending. You'd go out and spend $10,000 worth of employee time doing research analysis. Now, all of a sudden, people had to pay for it. So to keep just round numbers, <clears throat> say the Coke brand group was doing $10 million worth of, worth of marketing research every year. Well, they take 20% off right off the top of that and put that in the company's bottom line, increased profits. They take the $8 million they were spending, they put it back in their budget and say, you got $8 million in your budget now that you can use for marketing research. But any of this money you use is going to come straight out of your budget. Now, all of a sudden, the brand groups start to wonder, how much of this research do I really need? And maybe I can use that budget for something else. The bottom line the company found was, we had no accountability in marketing research. There was no accountability for the money we were spending and the work we were doing. By making it an SBU and a profit center, now there is accountability. Looking at the university now, outsource. The university used to run the bookstore. Why? We're not in the bookstore business. Let Follett run it. Um, we used to run food services. No, we're not. Let outsource that to Chartwells. Landscaping now. Why should we hire our own employees to be doing landscaping? Outsource it. Run it as an SBU. At least run it as an SBU. How about IT? Could we run IT as an SBU? Could we outsource that? Could we have a janitorial? Do we need our own employees to do janitorial? Maybe that would be well to be outsourced. Think about these things. At least do not have staff support, which has no accountability for their budget and how they use their time. Making it SBU or even consider outsourcing it entirely. So that's a thinking you get and organizing things. Then I've got to come down to say what's going on right now, and that's where I do the SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T. And that is I'm looking at what are my strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, in the old top-down way of looking at business, we just sort of set our ob objectives in isolation and then kind of figure out how and if we could get them done. Bottom-up thinking, which I'm going to advocate right here, I'm going to assess the marketing environment and how we're doing, especially vis-a-vis -vis the competition, and then I'm going to identify my opportunities and threats before 
before I set my objectives. Folks, it's similar to preparing for a football game. You may be going out there thinking of a football game, hey, I got a pretty good quarterback, I got some pretty good pass receivers out there, we'll go pass. Until you do your SWOT analysis and say, hmm, their defensive line, the average guy weighs 160 pounds. Our offensive line, the average guy weighs 220 pounds. Pass hell. We're going to run at him every play. Just keep running at him. <clears throat> By the time we get to the third quarter, they'll be laying down and say, please don't hurt me. I'm looking at my strategic advantage, and then I set my objectives. So when I'm doing this, the first thing I got to do is kind of take a portfolio analysis of what are my current products and services. One of the greatest ways to look at this is, and I know it's old from 1969, the Boston Consulting Group, the BCG Portfolio Matrix. Um, and on this thing here, we're looking at high and low growth markets, high and low share markets. Now on this, this is, is kind of interesting. You've all heard the term cash cow. This is where it came from. The Boston Consulting Group back in 1969 did this. And so what we're looking at, high share, high growth market, that's a star. That's your future for your company. That's where you want to really be putting, um, ultimately, all your hopes for growth. The cash cow, it's low growth, but you got a high share. What do you do with the cow? You milk it. So we milk the cash cow in order to wind up giving money to support the stars of the future. Now, it's kind of interesting, that one, that one on the upper right-hand corner there on that, uh, the basic, the high growth, low share, problem child slash question mark. When BCG came out with their matrix in 69, they called it a problem child. Now, in later years, a lot of people had called it instead a question mark. Now, this is not an easy question as to think about. Why would it tend to be a problem child versus be a question mark? Okay, the matter is pretty simple. It depends basically on how long you've been in the marketplace. So, for instance, um, so basically, let's say I am, um, I've been in the market for a long time. It's a high growth segment. I've got a low share of the market. I got a problem child. I'm not competing in a high growth segment. But <clears throat> let's say you're just coming into a segment as a late entry. By the way, that's a issue you don't want to deal with. You don't want to come in second. You want to come in first. But let's say you're coming in second. <clears throat> and it's a high growth segment, you're now joining the market. <clears throat> What's your market share on day one? Zero. You have a zero share. Okay, I get a zero share on, on, uh, on day one. Now, if six months from now, I've only got a three or four or five percent share of the market, I got a problem child. But if I've been successful, and I got a 30 percent, 40 percent share, I got a star. That's why the question mark comes in there. The question being simply that, wait a second, as I first get into a new segment as the second or third player in it, I don't know what I got yet, but I'm either going to have a problem child or, a, uh, or I'm going to have a star. And of course then, low growth, low share, it's a dog, shoot it between the eyes, get rid of this thing. So within this, of course, I'm also going to go and I'm going to assess the external environment. I'm going to look at the competition, the changing demographic and uh, social trends, everything outside the organization. That's the environmental scanning that we talked about in topic two. And so as I, after I've done this, now I begin to set marketing objectives. And basically in setting marketing objectives, I'm setting them to attain whatever differential advantage I happen to enjoy. That's the essence of bottom-up marketing, folks. So let's just think about this. For first possible example, I own a cost advantage in the production and distribution of my product and service. That might be a totally reasonable justification for taking on a, a production orientation. Remember, production orientation. I can produce it cheaper, I can put it out there. Yeah, it was, it was generally tended to be that, that period right after World War II. Might be today if you can put it on the shelf cheaper. Here again, going back to my puppyhood and my days in, and my days in Chicago with the company. I was out in some bottler, I think I was out in some place like Grand Isle, Nebraska, some place, and I walk in there and I, I, I talk now and sit in the bottler and talk to him and saying, well, our strategy next year is we're going to emphasize the two liter bottle. And uh, he says to me, no, I'm going to emphasize cans. And I said, well, why are you going to emphasize cans? And he sort of goes, and he says, well, son, there was a day that people actually called me son. He says, well, son, you see that building out back there? That's a can plant. 
I produce all my own cans on site here. I, I have a can plant that runs 3,000 cans a minute. It 12 packs them, it palletizes them. Pepsi doesn't have a can plant. Pepsi have to get, has to get their cans out of Omaha. They incur an additional 30 cent a case disadvantage on cans. I got 30 cent a case advantage on them on cans at account level. Now, you got a 30 cent a case advantage on cans vis-a-vis -vis Pepsi. How long can you fight a battle of attrition? Yeah, long time. <clears throat> I can go head to head and battling them on price promotions in the outlet on cans. I might be making just 20 cents a case on that. Pepsi's losing a dime a case, which means, by the way, I'm still making a little bit of money, but now Pepsi does not have the money to buy vending machines, uh, cold coolers for the convenience store, stuff like that. Makes sense in that case, because here again, I've got, I've got an advantage. Here's another possibility you might find as you, as you look at your situation. The tangible characteristics of your product and service are superior in some meaningful way. Your Marriott, your uh, John Deere, your Mercedes. So essentially, you've got quality that is worth paying for. Hey, basically, sell the benefits that justify your price in that situation. Oh, here's another situation that's a possibility, too. Your product or service owns an advantage in its positioning in the minds of the customer. It's positioning. It's an intangible thing more than anything else. A master brand like Bayer Clorox, Bayer Aspirin. It's a generic product. Bayer Aspirin is exactly the same thing as the Walgreens private label at 10 times the price. It's exactly the same. Clorox bleach is exactly the same thing as the Winn-Dixie private label at a substantially higher price. But in the minds of the customer, we'll get down to this in branding, it's positioned synonymous with the category. It's a master brand. And thus, I can justify higher prices on it. Um, the difference between a Porsche Cayenne and a VW Touareg is about $44,000. Essentially, they're the same car. But the name Porsche carries a whole lot better position in the customer's mind than VW. So what do I do? If I've got the positioning in the, in the customer's mind, enhance the intangibles and the image and ride on that thing. Here's the other possible advantage that you might discover. There is a niche market that you are uniquely able to serve, small enough to defend. Now, by the way, as a small business, yeah, you're going to go for the niche. If you're going to open a restaurant, open it for 2% of the, of the business. If you're going to open up um, an air conditioning business, 2% of the business, an accounting business, 2% of the business, specialize, niche it. Um, but big companies, too. Uh, you may find a lot of big companies today are going to introduce niche products. They're not trying to go up with the grand products. That's, that's going to take 50% of a given segment. We'll take a little bit of a segment of a high margin product. In any case, the objectives we're going to have have got to be reasonably attainable, objective, measurable, and have a specific time frame. So I'm setting an objective. I could say I want a 30% uh, share of the U.S. iPhone market within six months of product launch. Not, I just want to be number one iPhone, or not, I want to be a recognized as a leader in technology. Very, very specific. So out of this, we, this is where we are. Now then we come to Ansoft's opportunity matrix. And so what we're doing here now is begin to develop specific marketing strategies for new and existing products in new and existing markets. So within this, We've got, first of all, present product, present market. That's market penetration. So Campbell's Cream of Mushroom Soup, um, they have an on-pack offer that basically is a, a free recipe booklet uh, followed up by free coupon mailings when you send in three proofs of purchase. Same people, same product. Try this one closer to home. Orange juice. It's not just for breakfast anymore. It's still orange juice. It's still you. But I want you to drink it twice a day instead of just once a day. Present product, new market, that's market development. So we've got Kia is taking their existing line of cars and moving into Brazil. Or again, closer to home, we've got Senior United Captain Funds. New product, present market, that's product development. So we got Cox Cable here promoting phone and internet service uh, to its cable customers. Uh, garden store up there at Floral Tree Gardens. They're, they're basically getting the business now of introducing a line of gardening apparel uh, for people. So I got the same people coming in, but instead of just selling them plants and a bag of fertilizer, let's sell them some gardening apparel when they're there. And then finally, we've got new product, new market. That's diversification. 
Uh, here you've got uh, basically Armani going into the hotel business. Totally new product going after a totally new market. Be careful on some of these things. Another example, Coca-Cola decided uh, when I was at the company to get into the wine business. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Lord, we're selling pop to all the young people. Let's sell wine to mom and dad so we're the total beverage pr provider for the entire family. Okay. That's okay, okay, but we've got a little problem with that. Implementation execution. Uh, essentially, getting into the wine business, they bought Taylor Wines, but it has to go through a totally different distribution center. It cannot go through Coca-Cola bottlers. By law, it had to go through independent wholesalers with whom we had no relationships. In addition, we're going into a lot of accounts in which we either do not sell at all or we don't sell in that section of the store. So all of a sudden we found we, we can't execute. We don't have the system in place to do it. They wound up selling that business back at like 10 cents on the dollar. So then after this point, now let's go back and look at the marketing plan again because this is where things can be a little bit different in the real world than they are in... Um, in the theory, in, in the marketing plan, remember, we're going back here to step four. We talked about developer marketing strategy. All right, we're going to do that um, in topic nine. And uh, we're going to address that with the four Ps, uh, which is topic 10 to the end of the course. Now, that's traditionally in top-down marketing, in looking at the marketing plan, we have got step five is implementation, evaluation, and control. But as we noted, implementation is where the whole process begins. You've got to identify your competitive advantage first and then take the whole policy from there. So what we looked at back in that earlier graphic of looking at impl implementation, control, and all that stuff, uh, I'm looking at that at the very beginning of the process, not simply at the very end. Uh, one final note on this thing is that uh, as I go through this whole process here, I've got to challenge any and all existing assumptions. Out of this, you're going to find what are called sacred cows. Um, all those formulas, beliefs, and practices that built success in the past but won't get you there in the future. Yeah, the yellow pages worked great in the past. Let's continue it forever. Yeah, 30-second spots on TV worked great in the past. Let's continue it into the future. Uh-uh. What got you there is not going to move you to the future. So kind of keep that in mind and have the attitude in, in the back of your mind. This, if it ain't broke, no, no, no. If it ain't broke, break it. Well, that's topic six. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.